Hi everyone, I'm Vanessa Zakor. I'm here today with Sudi Burnett. She is a healer, life coach, and my mentor, and I'm very excited to present to you Sudi Burnett. Hello, tell us, who is Sudi Burnett? Hello, Vanessa John. Hello to all your audience. Um, I started as a personal trainer over 30 years ago. Uh, my obsession regarding my weight uh, lead me to get into this profession and as I was coaching people how to achieve their ideal weight I realized that there is a deeper connection between me and the people that I was working with and eventually we started to become friends and I started to get eventually into their family's dilemma and that leads me to get to the next step. I studied um, psychology just to because I was really fascinated by how people think, the way they behave. So I studied psychology, um, not as a practitioner, but just for myself. Um, I believe it was like 20 years ago, I got diagnosed myself with OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, repeated thoughts and um, I used to see a lot of numbers for instance I had two constant dialogues running through my head and if I was driving for instance in the freeway and I saw two miles to Wilshire Boulevard my brain started counting numbers one two three four five six so as time was going by my obsession started to become more and more and then um, I, um, I bought a Siamese cat. And um, after a while, the Siamese cat started getting on my nerves because when she was eating her food, she was messing up. And then my boyfriend at the time, he told me, he says, I think you have to see someone regarding this issue because you, can, you cannot expect the cat to be eating so neatly and not to mess up. So, like I said, I went to a neurologist and I got diagnosed at OCD. That was my next journey into even getting further into um, not only obsession, but, but what is behind obsession. So, um, I realized that I, I used to be really anxious. Like, I had to be really fast and I had to beat up every time by time. Everyone else on this planet looked like they were moving slow motion. The whole world was really, really slow. And I was just like, what the hell is going on here? I felt extremely out of place. And I didn't know, like, um, maybe I was supposed to be in a different planet. And this is not my planet because everyone and everything is really slow. Um, I have to say I was an extreme fast, quick learner. Um, when I went to university, every time um, I had to pass a test, it wouldn't make more than 20 minutes. Wow. So when I handed <laughs> my uh, paper, the, the examiner usually would look at it and say, are you done? And I was like, yes, I am, because my brain was just moving really, really quickly. I wish I was like that. <laughs> but, <laughs> It would have been great. It would have been perfect if it was only that issue. But like I said, I also had two constant dialogue running through my head. So basically, that was the main issue because I was very confused. Like, who is saying what? Which voice would I be listening? And I started that really started my journey. Well... Sounds very interesting, and um, I'm excited to hear because I know your background and I know what you do now, mm -hmm. and it kind of make, makes sense that you right now can relate to your past and why that came into that is in your life. And please explain to the audience that um, how you channel, mm -hmm. how you are a healer, and um, help so many people in this world and please tell okay them. I think um, looking back when I was 10 year old for
for people who read my biography, I was born um, in Iran, used to be called Persia. I still have a lot of resistance calling it Iran instead of Persia. <laughs> but anyways, um, I grew up in a very wealthy family um, with a 10 years age different from my last sister. So although I, I was born in a kind of large family, but I grew up as the only child. I used to wander in the garden every morning when everyone else left home. And I used to go and I had this deep connections with nature's. So every day I would go, my play would have been to cut all the flowers and plants and make a soup. And somehow now I know when I look back that that was my background of uh, living past lives as a shaman. That's how I was connecting with leaves and earth and dirt and plant and why I was supposed to make a soup every day for people to eat my soup and be happy. I should call that, maybe I should come up with that recipe, happy soup. <laughs> As you do now, when I come to your home, it's, it's a feast and she's an amazing cook, you guys. You have to, <laughs> if you get lucky enough to meet her and come to her home, her beautiful home, you get to taste her amazing cooking and it really does make you happy and feel healthy and you feel like as much as you eat, you won't gain weight. It's crazy, <laughs> but please go on. Thank you, love. So anyways, um, my mission as a child was how would I make everyone else's happy? Mm -hmm. I remember when I was like five years old, we had a neighbor and um, there was an older gentleman, he was blind. He was 50 years old when I was five years old. Wow. And that was my very best friend. His name was Ali oh, <laughs> He so was a, you know, when you're five year old, you're so little and he was so big and huge to me. So the way we started to become friends is one day I was, playing on the street and then this gentleman, this huge giant man walked out. The first thing I noticed there was something weird about those huge big eyes that was popping out and very soon I realized there is something wrong with those eyes. I still didn't know that he's blind. And then the kids on the street just started to tease him like, Ali Aga is crazy, Ali Aga is crazy and he started going nuts and that was like when I became his savior. I started fighting with all the other kids and I got very close to him and that was the beginning of our friendship. So every morning he used to come and pick me up and um, I had major, major issue uh, from age five or six about uh, my identity, who I was. And I needed to be powerful. I think that was the first click that I needed to be um, very powerful to support other people who were in need of being supported. And then I started doubting um, why was I born as a girl? Because as a five-year-old child, to me, boys were supposed to be strong and, you know, the heroes. And I couldn't see myself being a hero and being in a female body. So I had a lot of conflict from age five. Eventually, as time went by, um, um, I, was, I started going to school, but I couldn't sit in the class because um, there was something weird or odd about classrooms. And from second or third grade, every single day before the teacher walks in, an hour earlier, <clears throat> all the children would sit in the class and I would go to the blackboard and I would ask every child what question did they have and I would be answering their question and I never ever attended any classes I used wow. to be in the playgrounds so today when I look back Vanessa it's, it's just like so many things it's like a question mark if I never sat in a class, how did I know to how did I know what the question was and what, what, what the answer was? You know what I'm saying? Yes. Again, today I know like 
for me, seeing so many of my past lives being a teacher or a counselor, that's where those knowledge was coming in. So fast forward, uh, at age 10, um, I was a daddy's girl, and my father used to go to north of Iran, so we were used to my dad leaving home for a week and come back home on the weekend. Um, the last time my father left to go to north of Iran, as I was hugging him, there was some inner feeling like I need to hold down as much as I can. Um, and it just felt like, I would not see this man ever again. So my dad was like holding me like, honey, he was trying to separate me and I will be back in the weekend and then, but it just didn't feel right to me. So anyways, he left and then um, I went to my sister, my older sister, because um, my niece and my nephews are closer to my age and I spent the summertime there. It was hot summer and we used to play and one day in the afternoon, 2 p.m., there was a phone call. My brother-in-law picked up the phone, and he, I looked at him. I was extremely sensitive since I was a little child. And I saw as my uh, brother-in-law is talking over the phone, tears start to run down his eyes. And he hung up the phone, and he looked at my sister, and he says, let's go. Um, we got to go. Your uncle passed away. Now, at that time, my youngest uncle, he, um, he had cancer. And all the doctors, they were like, sorry, it was, we cannot do anything for him. So it was expected for my uncle to go away. So it just made sense that my uncle has passed away and my sister and my brother-in-law has to leave. So they sent uh, my driver to my sister and we played around for another week. After a week, they took us home to my home, and they said since my father was the older brother, the funeral is going to be happening there. And uh, Iranian funerals, if you guys are not used to it, it's not like here in the U.S. one day. It can go on for months or two months, and people are still coming to greet you. And So anyways, um, the first day I got home, I, I was playing with all my nieces, nephews, cousins and stuff. In the middle of our playing, um, I felt very tired. That was the very first time I went into a trance. But of course, at 10 year old, you don't know what trance is. So I felt extremely tired and I have to go and take a nap and I went on my bed and boom, I fell asleep. And suddenly I saw, it, it was like a dream state that my dad is driving, It's it's like, really really dark and then some car is coming towards him he's smoking his left hand is outside the car as he's smoking blowing the smoke the light becomes the upcoming light is too much my dad cannot handle it he lose the his control and his car went down the alley and i saw he kind of the door opened up he fell off the car and hit his head against the stone, the blood flushed out, and I just jumped and I started screaming and I said, you guys have lied to me, my father is dead. And then my mom got emotional, she passed out and my cousin came to me and she said, you are right, but we didn't know how to put it. Oh my God. So anyways, um, that's okay, hon, it's, it's part of story. From age 10, um, I started to make a connection with my father's spirit. He would come and visit me every single day. And um, I had a dialogue with my father. Like, I was very upset. You know, it's just like when you get your, for the first time, when you start to make that connection with your inner child, the inner child is extremely angry. And you're like, hi, honey, I want to make this connection. And your inner child is like, no way, Jose. You know, you have left me out for so long and I've been sitting here and waiting and waiting and waiting and now you want to make a connection so um, at the beginning it was like I was like very upset every night when my father will come I was like you know what I'm upset I'm pissed off I was screaming yelling and it is you're not really sleep but it's that 
trans state, you know. So eventually I started to give up and I started talking to my father. So then our dialogue started happening and I asked my father why. I am only 10 years old. Why do you have to leave now? And my father started to explain to me things that it didn't make sense. You know, a 10-year-old like, oh, honey, you know, you have chosen this stuff. I was like, what? what the hell are you talking about? I have chosen this to be separated from you. So um, from age 10, I started to gravitate towards acting. Mm. And everything is life is planned. And there is a reason for all of that. There was so much pain losing my father. And because my mother, she was a very gentle, graceful, spiritual lady, but I find her very weak at the time. So because she was crying all the time and she was going through this heavy, heavy grief and that stuff, I couldn't grieve myself. Therefore, I started to be strong for my mother, right? So I have to show her that I was okay with that and everything was fine. So therefore, I never had a chance to grieve because I had to be tough and hard in order for my mom to be okay. But I started to gravitate towards acting because at that age, um, I started to make the pain of losing my father, the trauma was so huge that I started to make it like it didn't happen. It never happened. So acting became very easy for me because I could have just acted out anything I wanted. And I did a couple of plays, age 10, 14, 15. But also from the same time, I just really felt out of place. I started to question everything. Like my family was, I didn't feel my family was my family. I start telling my mother, you're not my mother. This is the wrong place. My gender is in incorrect. I should have been a boy. I shouldn't have been born here. You guys are not. I feel extremely um, out of place. At age um, 14, um, I started to um, play music. And I fell in love with my music teacher. And very soon my family find out and um, they started to put me in, in a really strict curfew because the, my, act, my teacher wasn't in our class and uh, that was a lot really in, incorrect um, love affair or whatever. So um, that started and I decided that life was really hard. Um, I wasn't able to handle all this thing. And once I fell in love, even that is wrong, according to my family. So I committed suicide at age 14. Wow. And I took, a, I took a lot of pills and I went, I was almost gone. For some reason, my sister find out and um, they rushed me to the hospital and they made me... <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> so yeah, wow. um, that after that I started to think that there's only one way to end the suffering, and that would be for me to come to U.S. So from age 12 or 13, all I was thinking about is how and what is the quickest way I can make it to United States. Some inner feeling was telling me that United States was the place, was my real home, and that's where I was supposed to be. So of course I graduated from high school, never attended any classes, I passed with good grades. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could do that. Yeah. <clears throat> so then um, I uh, left Iran when I was 18, I moved to Canada because a Canadian ambassador was living close by and he helped me out to get a visa for Canada and then 
I uh, came to Canada, I lived there for four years, and all I was thinking, when can I get my citizenship, and boom, make the next move. And then finally I made it to state, I came to Los Angeles, and I remember it, it is like this moment when the plane was coming on LA, close to be landing, my soul felt so happy. Oh, I am finally home. Wow. Wow. I always said your whole story should be a movie. It right. should be right. like a soap opera. It's just, <laughs> it's an amazing story. And I'm very happy that you're sharing this with the American community and your home. Are yeah. this American community? Yes. I am wondering. <laughs> <laughs> I'd hate to cut it here, but if you'd like to hear the rest of her amazing story, please continue to watch part two.